My name is Stephen Owen. I'm the Vice President, External Legal and Community Relations for the University of British Columbia, and I'm co-hosting this evening's discussion, and it's very much a discussion rather than a presentation, but with my co-host, Rena Lazar, who is the Executive Director of Peace It Together, which I'm sure certainly by now everyone will have known about. Rina and a very talented, courageous, young Palestinian-Canadian, Adre Hamel, uh, six or seven years ago, started the Peace It Together Society in Vancouver to assist with bringing young people from Palestine, Israel, and Canada together for peace discussions and to make films, going right to the heart of the issues in the Middle East, from humiliation at the border to love across the divide to uh, terrorism and, and killings. Uh, and to see young people through the films that have been produced by Peace It Together um, express life-changing experiences that they've gone through at a young age, coming to grips with the reality of the Middle East and life more generally and violence that can attend it um, is an extraordinary program. So I'm very pleased uh, to have Rena here tonight and to co-host with Peace It Together. Uh, Rena will be uh, taking part in the discussion with our our guests tonight, which I'll introduce in a moment, and then at the end of the program, there will be a short film on Piece It Together just to acquaint you with what has been accomplished, and Rena will, will be speaking a little about the program that will be done this next summer, the third film project that will be located on the University of British Columbia with the Canadian, Palestinian, and Israeli students uh, living in residence, working with peace educators on campus, and working with the um, film school of UBC graduate students to produce this next uh, rotation of films. <coughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, this is a, an extraordinary event, quite frankly, uh, for the University of British Columbia and I think for all of us here, because for all of the academic attention and uh, studies from abroad and strong feelings of community and experience in, in other sorts of conflict in our lives, um, this is quite extraordinary. There's nothing academic, there's nothing theoretical, and there's nothing but courageous about our two guests tonight. Um, Sami Adwan, Dr. Adwan, is the director of PRIME, the Peace Research Institute in the Middle East, uh, based in Bethlehem, but working across Palestine and Israel uh, to bring issues of education to youth about historical narratives and how they differ over time between the Israeli and Palestinian communities and to try and bridge common ground at an educational level uh, with uh, children, students in, at that point in their time when they're so open to ideas and so open to being swayed as well by strong ideas, strong opinions. Uh, Sami and Prime help to open those minds to each other. Uh, Dr. Gershon Baskin is the co-director, the Israeli co-director of the Israel-Palestine uh, Center for Research and Information. It's a peace think tank and action tank in, uh, located in Jerusalem, but working across the border that has been instrumental in the last over the last 20 years in jointly advising from the moderate center uh, of ideas and, and uh, resolutions, advising from the Oslo process all the way to Camp David and the uh, 2000 final status negotiations, being trusted, moderate, crossing the border, uh, thoughtful ideas into those negotiating tables. Uh, and Gershon continues with IPCRI to, even in the frustrations of the current deadlock, uh, to be bringing forward ideas for resolution. So I think in introducing our, our guests, um, what I'd like to underline more than anything is that these two uh, learned, courageous leaders from the Middle East have got the courage to cross the lines, uh, to look for moderate solutions uh, to each other's communities. It's all too easy for all of us in whatever our interest position, group uh, might be, to feed off the support, uh, and often very positively, of our own group, our own supporters, our own point of view. It takes much more uh, imagination and I would say courage 
to actually step across the moderate middle and make common cause with moderates from other points of view and to learn from them. So this is a, a, an institution of higher learning and education um, and perhaps the most important concept in education is keeping an open mind. And these uh, two are really champions of this very, very difficult process um, that is as dangerous as any in the world and, and uh, has been uh, testing wise and people of goodwill for so many decades um, are here to talk to us about some of the solutions. And some of the opinions that you'll express and will be expressed to you, you won't agree with. And that's part of the open concept of this dialogue. We're calling it a Pacific Dialogue. It's a series of dialogues at the University of British Columbia that plays on both uh, place and promise, as you, uh, a place of mind, a place, uh, the Pacific is the geographic place, and of mind, of Pacific mindfulness. And so with that, I'd just like to say that for the next hour and a half or so, um, we will first have a discussion amongst ourselves uh, so that uh, Gershon and Sammy can express to you directly the background of their work and the uh, hopes they have for the future and what's happening in their opinion right now. Uh, then we will go to a dialogue with all of us uh, where we will take people's, uh, ask for people's opinions, people's questions. Uh, we'll try and keep them quick, short and direct and not repetitive, but um, I think in the in the spirit of, of peaceful dialogue, uh, we welcome you very much to this uh, event this evening. So we will begin, I think, with uh, a question from Rita. Great. Is my microphone on? It is? Okay, great. Just before we start, I just want to say that I'm very honored uh, to be sharing the stage with these three gentlemen. And I do have to say that the opinions you hear tonight are not necessarily the opinions of Piece It Together. I just have to say that. <laughs> um, Oh, I, everything I say will be, of course, uh, directly attributable to the president, Stephen too. <laughs> exactly. <coughs> exactly. So the first question is, is uh, maybe the most meaty one, which has to do with, I'd like each of you to tell us about yourself, about your work, about what motivated you to do the work that you're doing, and the impact that the work has had. <laughs> okay. <laughs> First, I want to thank for Stephen and UBC to host us here. It's an honor for us to be here, cross the ocean and be with you in this lovely evening. Uh, you know, there are many, I think, layers and stages of your life that you pass through uh, this, uh, in, this, in this area. One of them, I, you know, maybe this is the first time I'm saying that in front of this big audience. Um, I grew up as a little child, you know, under occupation uh, in 1967, uh, always looking at my land has been taken, you know, from in 1948. And when I went, grew up also, of course, losing your childhood, when I grew up and went to Jordan and even to the state, I never communicated with Israeli or Jewish guy. I never, I used to avoid them accusing every Jew or every Israeli is, is behind my trauma and my suffering. Then I went back home and uh, I, as any a Palestinian who are subjected to any, uh, to, you know, any, 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 any events in his life, I, you know, happened to be in Israeli jails. I was detained and my detention was administrative detention. I don't know if you're familiar with this term, administrative detention. If this law is, is, giving, is giving the security, the Israeli security system to detain you without official charges, without conviction. So it could be for six months, one year, two years. And through my jail experiences, uh, you, there's time to think and rethink and discover yourself and say, you know, I think avoiding each other is not the way forward. I think we have to meet with each other and we have to address the issue that's in our mind. But what, what is it for me as an educator to do? So at that time, I was teaching at Hebrew University. You know, what can be done? What should I do? Then, uh, when I was released from jail, I met Israelis for the first time as a human civilian. Then it, that's my journey started. Why i motivated to, to do this, I think um, both Israel and Palestinian have been uh, intentionally or unintentionally avoiding the existence of others. 
uh, they grew up in their daily life thinking that it's, it's only them and not the others to be in that place. That's one side. The other side of the story is so much trauma, so much suffering has been occurred day by day among Palestinian and Israelis. And to be a Palestinian with, uh, with certain level of subjectivity, I don't want the Palestinian to, con to continue living under occupation. So my message and my mot main motivation is how to use peaceful means and ways of ending the occupation and ending the conflict. And also uh, for the Palestinian to be able to stand on their lands as a human being with their dignity and their freedom as any other nation in the world. So that's my, my. Yes. And, the, and the other thing is how to stop the continuation of trauma and traumatization that continue on for so long and without end, without any uh, potential you know, hope for that. And that's why I joined the peace camp. Joining the peace camp also, it's, it's a big challenge for me to be completely from being accusing of being avoidance to be also part in this peace camp. And when I start working in 1995, I start using my ability as an educator, either teacher trainers or also crossing borders and trying to stretch out. Meaning that in 1995, we start working with the issue of textbooks. You know, we thought as educators, textbooks is a key plays a key role in educating people, in trying to develop the identity. And we did a very comprehensive research, and the finding is not that uh, strange, that either it, both sides focus on their monolithic way of addressing the issue, the other side is hardly mentioned, and if it's mentioned, it's mentioned in a stereotypical way, the, or when it's mentioned on, on, only to show how negative. And what struck us also, it's a, it's a representation of cultural war. It's not culture of peace. That's, that's why it's a big challenge to move textbooks from being represented of a representation of cultural war to culture of peace. And the peaceful coexistence by Palestinian, Jews, Christian, Muslim is missing in the textbooks. That's why we did this research and this book and this finding. And later on, we based on trying to establish prime and I just want to make one addition. Prime is a, a Palestinian Israeli NGO. I'm the Palestinian co-director, and we have also an Israeli co-director. Yes. So that's how I start working and motivated, because it's, the conflict is taking a big toll on all of us. It's creating more pain and suffering, and there should be a way to resolve it that peacefully. Maybe later on I talk about Prime. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Christian. I'm an Israeli by choice, which means that I immigrated to Israel 33 years ago. I grew up, I was born in the United States, in New York. I was born into a family with a very positive Jewish identity. I never experienced anti-Semitism in my life. So my motivating force that brought me to Israel was a positive force, not a negative force. I grew up in a very Jewish neighborhood and when I was 14 years old, we moved to a different town where I suddenly find myself as a minority in the school where I was going. And I was approached, uh, as minorities often look for each other, I was approached by a young Jewish guy in my class who told me that they were establishing a chapter of a Zionist youth movement in our town, Young Judea, and invited me to join, and I liked it. It was interesting, it was compelling, it was challenging, it was a good place to meet Jewish girls. And I joined, um, and I got very involved. It, prior to that, I got politically active uh, at the tail end of the 1960s in the civil rights movement in the United States and in the anti-war movement. I was 12 years old and dragging my parents to drive me to demonstrations against the war. And at some point, in the middle of high school, my political orientation with regard to conflict merged with my Zionist education that I was getting in the Zionist youth movement that I was a member with. And sometime early in the mid-70s, early 70s, I came to the realization that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict had to be resolved on the basis of two states for two people. I decided when I was 16 years old that I was going to immigrate to Israel. I spent a year in Israel between high school and the beginning of university. 
And when I got back, I started getting politically involved in searching out for dialogue with Palestinians in the university. Only I kept coming across closed doors. In 1976, uh, two friends of mine and I went to visit the PLO ambassador in the United Nations in New York City. And he agreed to see us behind closed doors after work hours. And uh, during the one and a half hours that we discussed the issues with Ambassador Terzi, who passed away, um, we appealed to him to recognize the state of Israel and accept the two-state solution, to which he responded over my dead body. Now, I was really disturbed by that response because I was convinced way back then that eventually we had to come to a solution where we could live in peace with our neighbors. And the way to peace with our neighbors had to be through ending the Israeli occupation of the occupied territories and seeing the establishment of a democratic, independent Palestinian state next to Israel. But I didn't know how to go about it. There was no grabbing point. So when I immigrated to Israel, I searched for ways of getting involved. And what I did is I went and lived in a Palestinian Arab village inside of Israel for two years and did community volunteer work, trying to bridge the gap between Jewish and Palestinian citizens of Israel on the basis of citizen to citizen understanding, democracy, civil rights, the language that I understood from the civil rights struggles in the United States. But I always knew in the back of my mind that the issue of equality and the end of discrimination against the Palestinian citizens of Israel would really only come about once there was peace between Israel and the Palestinians and Israel and the Arab world, and I waited for an opportunity. And at the beginning of the first Intifada, at the end of 1987, when the Palestinian national movement's uprising was coming from the refugee camps in the occupied territories, not from Tunis, not from Lebanon, not from Algeria, but from inside, on the ground, I understood that a revolution was taking place. And one Saturday morning in March of 1988, I got on my little Vespa motorcycle and drove to the Daisha refugee camp, not far from where Sammy lives, and walked into the camp, took off my helmet, I was immediately approached by some young people who said, what are you doing here, who are you? And I said to him, I'm an Israeli, and I want to understand what the Intifada is about. I want to listen to you. And we stood in the parking lot of the UNRWA school, the refugee school, inside the refugee camp in Dehesha, and they, a group of young people started to explain to me what they were fighting for, and eventually invited me to go to back to one of their homes, and I spent six hours in the refugee camp talking about solutions to the conflict. And I came to understand at that moment that that starting point that I was waiting for, the entry point for dialogue on the basis of mutual recognition, was born in the first Intifada. And that's how I began doing what I'm doing today, 22 years ago. Thank you. Well, let's jump ahead 22 years. And it's today, and many of us, and particularly in the Middle East, are feeling great frustration at the apparent lack of progress uh, on peace negotiations, although there's some ebb and, and tide there. What, where are we now? How close are we to the comprehensive, sustainable peace, uh, two nations living side by side in peace and security and recognition? Um, is that a distant hope? Are we? getting further away from it, or are things culminating towards a solution? Uh, Sammy. Um, I think uh, uh, way back in the late 70s, when the PLO was recognized by the UN uh, community as uh, the sole representative of the Palestinian people, that's, that's you know, led us to, uh, to start thinking Clearly, of course, the national aspiration has started before, but uh, we have a Palestinian representative. That's one thing clear. But other, before that, they were fluctuated between you know, being part of Jordan or part of Egypt, etc. But these processes went on, uh, and uh, the PLO, of course, issued the statement, uh, independence statement 1998 for two-state solution recognition of view UN uh, decisions 242338, which I'm sure you're familiar with that. And that leads to, um, leads, uh, that was, it came after, immediately after the Intifada, which was started after 20 years of occupation. And uh, I think the Intifada is, one of the results of the Intifada is to, uh, is, has led to, uh, to, 
to Madrid conference in 1992, led later on to the secret talks that started or later on to be become disclosed of Oslo Agreement 1993. So from 1993 and on, there's we have been into, uh, of course, the Oslo Accord has created a space for Palestinian and Israeli first to face to negotiate and discuss open and hard issue, though they avoided five issues. Uh, Oslo Agreement meant to be, uh, it's, it's three, four stages should be. One, the first stage uh, in, uh, was signed, uh, there was so hope, much, it's been seen also, difference between the Palestinian and Israeli. From, from the Palestinian side, it was seen it's a stage where it leads to uh, establishing a Palestinian state. From the Israeli side, it started, you know, stop the conflict and start just a new wave of uh, negotiation. We witnessed from 1993, to up to recently uh, with uh, many rounds of peace talks, negotiation, discussions, Cairo, uh, Y River, um, Roadmap, many, many of these. Uh, while the peace talks is going on and the peace process is going on, I think it became, it become much more difficult even for the politician to find out where is it and what is it uh, that we are looking for. Uh, though the, for my side, I think the, the solution is very easy. It's, uh, you know, it's not, we should not reinvent the wheel, etc. cetera. Um, from one side, the Palestinians, I just want to make just very lot. From one side, the Palestinians uh, from 1993 start building, hopefully, their future state to be established within five years, six years, eight years. And the failure of Camp David one, uh, Camp David two in 2000, were uh, you know hit a strike for all the peace process because that's when we both sides uh, think that peace is next door, so is tomorrow. So yeah. So now th then it was continued later on. At this stage, I think we are in a very uh, impasse or deadlock in the peace negotiation. Uh, we there's so much hope that uh, the American. You know, we put some pressure. They failed to put so much pressure in the negotiation. Now the P, uh, the PLO, the PNA now, start thinking, you know, uh, direct negotiation, direct negotiation did not lead anywhere. So there's no hope that w this will be uh, kind of, there's a breakthrough in the near future. The, the Palestinian Authority is starting to put some pressure of trying to get an international recognition uh, unilaterally, and I don't support it. It should be uh, supported, uh, agreed by the Israeli first, and should go that. Uh, we are not uh, close to any kind of peace uh, negotiation or break uh, through in, in the near future. And I'm, I'm, I'm not optimistic that something will happen in the near future. Of course, the, P, the P, Palestinian situation now between Gaza and the West Bank, it's two authorities here are trying also to mend their, uh, their issues, which is also hard and difficult. Uh, the, the Arab world and the region, also the international world, as if they feel impotent to put so much pressure on them. Thank you. Kirshen, when we met a year ago, a year and a half ago, in Jerusalem, you were you presented me with what you were presenting and about to publish and have published of a potential way forward. Could you tell us about that? Well, there, there it's probably 10 versions ago of different yeah. ways <laughs> forward. I'm, I'm almost every day issuing a, a way forward. Um, we have to recognize that there is one solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. The only solution to this conflict is the two states for two people solution. If by solution we mean end of conflict, there's no other way to, under, to end this conflict other than taking the land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea and partitioning it into two states for the two people living in the land. And everyone knows what this looks like. There's no rocket science involved anymore in resolving the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. 22 years ago when I founded IPCRI and started bringing Israeli and Palestinian experts together to search for solutions on Jerusalem, on refugees, on borders, on security, on, on economic relations, you name it. We had a lot of question marks. Today, 22 years later, there's not a single issue in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that we don't know how to resolve. 
And not only us, the experts who have been doing this, but everyone. Everyone sitting in this audience knows what the solution to this conflict is. We know what the agreement looks like, more or less. We know that the borders are going to be established on the basis of June 1967 with modified uh, uh, territorial swaps somewhere between 3 and 4% of the land, which will allow some almost 80% of the settlers to remain where they are and the others will have to either come back or go to the annexed areas. We know that Jerusalem is going to be the future capital of both states. We know that the Palestinian refugees who want to go home, most of them will end up going back to the Palestinian state. Israel will have to admit and acknowledge some part of its responsibility for the creation of the refugee problem. There'll be an international fund of which Canada will participate in as well that will help refugees begin a new life in their new state. We know what the solutions are. Barack Obama knows what the solutions are. Mahmoud Abbas knows what the solutions are. And Benjamin Netanyahu knows what the solutions are. So where's the problem? We all know what it is. We all know what the agreement's going to look like. We know what compromises are necessary. The problem that we face is, as Sami said, we have an 18-year-old failed process. And when a peace process fails, it's not so easy to get it started again because it's not a matter of, hey, I have good intentions now. I didn't before, but now I'm the good guy. It doesn't work like that. Too many people have paid with their lives. There's been too much bloodshed. Too much suffering has happened because of a failed process. So that's why everyone is so cautious today. Now, it appears that we have an impasse. It appears that we have a situation where the Palestinians are saying we will not enter into direct negotiations again with Israel until Israel demonstrates its seriousness for peacemaking by freezing all settlement building. By the way, this is an obligation of Israel that dates back to the roadmap issued by George W. Bush in, 19, in 2003. One of the obligations of Israel under the roadmap was to freeze all settlement building for all purposes, including natural growth. This is not a new demand. But for the Palestinians, the lack of freezing settlement building is an indication to them, with good cause, that perhaps Israel is not sincere about its intentions to make peace. On the other hand, the Israelis say, We've been building settlements all along. It says nowhere in the peace process, nowhere in any of the five agreements that we signed that we have to freeze building. And if we end up building more and we give those houses to the Palestinians, what do they lose from it? So we're at an impasse now because this has turned into the issue. Unfortunately, in my view, this was an era of the Obama administration. From day one, Obama said the Israelis must freeze settlement building. Now, it's logical to understand why you said that. But in response to that, President Abbas, the Palestinian president, says, if Barack Obama is saying the Israelis have to free settlement building, how can you expect for me, the Palestinian president, to say anything less? So when Israel doesn't, we have an impasse now. Now, how do we get around this impasse? Because everyone knows, as Sammy said, an agreement must be negotiated. At the end, both sides must agree. The problem is that there won't be any direct negotiations now. So the Americans started doing what they called proximity talks. It's a strange kind of concept. Proximity talks means close talks. But they're not really close. They're not sitting together. They're not talking together. The question is, can you use a process of proximity talks to bring about an agreement? George Mitchell, whose experience comes from Northern Ireland, worked on a, con on a conflict in Northern Ireland which was primarily focused on process. In Northern Ireland, the issues don't concern final status. In the 21st century with the European Union, it doesn't really matter if Northern Ireland becomes part of the United Kingdom or part of the Republic of Ireland. It doesn't matter that much. In Northern Ireland, the issue was how do you get the Catholics and the Protestants to govern together? But in Israel and Palestine, it's not about process. We've been processed to death over the last 18 years. It's about substance. It's about issues. Jerusalem, borders, security, refugees, etc. So can you use a process of proximity talks to deal with substance? And the answer is yes. If the Americans own the process and they set the agenda and stop pandering to the bickering of the parties in terms of process and begin using what you as a conflict resolution expert know, the single text negotiation, the Americans begin to draft the text and turn the talks into, instead of talking about negotiations, talking about the text that the Americans are drafting, 
then we can move the process forward. Because then we get to focus on the issues. The issue is not settlement building. The issue is the border. Where is the border between Israel and Palestine? Once we know where the border is, Israel can build freely in the areas that will be annexed to Israel. Likewise in Jerusalem, etc. All these issues can be resolved. Now, if they're not going to do this, and I've lost my confidence, unfortunately, in the good offices of Barack Obama and the American administration in this process, we have a situation where the Palestinians are doing what they need to do. In my view, this is perhaps the first time that the Palestinian leadership is doing everything right. By gaining bilateral recognition for the existence of the Palestinian state on the basis of the 1967 border, one state after the other, we're going to have a situation where virtually every country in the world, perhaps except Israel and the United States, recognize the two-state solution. It has to be brought to international fora, such as the United Nations, to solidify that, and that's a process that's beginning now. The issue of Palestinian statehood, the issue of ending the occupation, the issue of peace have to become non-negotiable. These are fait accompli. And then we negotiate on the basis of those two states, the border and the arrangement for Jerusalem and the security guarantees and the role of the third parties in monitor, monitoring and verifying the agreements, etc. But there are lots of ways of moving forward. We have to remain optimistic because this conflict is resolvable. So go straight to status and then work out the details rather than the other way around. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is where you say, don't hold back, tell us what you really think. <laughs> um, <laughs> you're both uh, expressing some real frustration with the top, with the government, with various governments, and yet you're both very involved in engaging the public. So I'd like to switch a little bit to that in terms of what you do to engage um, the people on the ground, what impact that has, and a, a little twist to the question about the role of media new media, social media, and all that stuff. So, uh, do you want to go first this time? Okay. okay. <laughs> um, we, we in IPRI have, have developed a, a kind of um, a two, a, two screens or two lens that we view our work through. One is what we call peacemaking, and the other is what we call peace building. Peacemaking is the work of track two. It's the work of dialogue with policymakers. It's the work of trying to come up with the solutions, the memos that we send out um, once every two weeks to the, to the White House and to the negotiating teams. Um, the work of peace building is figuring out how to bring Israelis and Palestinians together to work on a common issue which they share and need to cooperate on. The obvious one is the environment. Um, the environment knows no boundaries. A, a pollution travels wherever it wants to with the flow of the wind. The water shortage is something that you Canadians don't know anything about, <laughs> but is, it exists and is very severe for us. And we have to cooperate on water issues, on environment issues. Likewise, education, as Sami said, we need to create a culture of peace, not a culture of hatred, a culture of trust, not a culture of suspicion. These are issues of commonality between Israelis and Palestinians, and there's a broad base of things that we can do. So we worked for many years in bringing together teachers and looking at textbooks and developing curriculum, trained thousands of teachers who've come through us. Um, uh, you attended one of our conferences in 2006 that brought together 220 Israeli Palestinians and foreigners who came along to help the process. So we've been doing this for a long time. On the issue of environment, the, the most exciting thing that I'm doing these days um, of seeing real progress is that we recently, a couple of months ago, established a Palestinian renewable energy company. Now here's a classic win-win issue. We have, thank God, the blessing of the sun, and we have a lot of sun. And we also know that from the sun you can produce electricity. We also know that the Palestinian Authority purchased 100% of their electricity in the West Bank from Israel. We also know that the Israeli electrical network is terribly, terribly overburdened. And because of needs of diversification, even with the latest natural gas fines, the current Minister of Infrastructure in Israel is planning to construct, get this, two new coal-burning electricity plants in Israel. Something which is certainly not in the interest of humanity, nor in the interest of the people who have to breathe the air, directly next to those electric plants. 
So we know that if the Palestinians can develop alternative renewable energy sources from the sun and from the wind, not only will they be creating energy independence for an independent Palestinian state, but we will be reducing the burden on the Israeli electricity network, and maybe as a result of that, they won't have to build one of those coal burning plants, maybe both of them, if we can work fast enough. So here's a classic win-win, where we're bringing together Israeli and Palestinian energy experts. We're trying to negotiate a deal where the wealthy state of Israel will help the Palestinians by providing a tariff feed-in, a subsidy for the production of solar energy, which will make solar energy at this point today, before there's grid parity, economically feasible. We have the will of an amazing group of Palestinian investors who I, I was, I've been trying to fundraise for 30 years for nonprofits like the one I run, and, and I'm so used to people telling me no. I have people, Palestinians, angry at me because I didn't ask them to give me $50,000 to invest in the company. This is something entirely new. But this is the new era where we see things happening on the ground. So we're not talking about peace and building cooperation, we're doing it. Well, um, the other aspect of it, we're trying to build a culture of peace through education. That's why we, what PRIME stands for, actually. And that's why we engage in teacher training and also uh, trying to pre publish, and we already published three books talking about the Palestinian Israeli historical narrative. And that's based on my previous presentation about both sides, they don't teach about each other. They only teach about themselves. So what we have been working since 12 years is try to educate teachers and try to write books that include both side narratives, meaning that we would like to explore the possibility if the Palestinian children and the Israeli children start recognizing the existence of different narrative, would that help in creating a space of understanding and a space of respects? When we started the process, of course, we started uh, in, in 1990s. It was the peace era between 1993. It was easy to work, you know, in, in such project. And we enter, when we entered 2000 and, and later on, it became so much difficult. But we were successfully developed three booklets, and these booklets used are in some Palestinian, some Israeli schools. When we thought about it as an educational tool and educational reform, because education should be moved from being continue supporting and perpetuating the conflict to be part of the solution. Unfortunately, our project has not been accepted by both ministries. And if you follow the news in, the, in October and later on, we, we became under extremely critical position because both ministries rejected our proposals just to introduce to each other's children, the other side narratives. When we started working on that, we thought also how we would like also to train teachers, because teachers are much, uh, you know, important in, the, in these processes, because they are the one who will take these uh, material to their classrooms. Um, since the ministries, both sides rejected that, so teachers and school use it, what we call it, you know, under the radar of both ministers, the, the, some teachers here and there use the, the project and the material, and some of them, when they get, to, they get to be known, they will be reprimanded and being called and warned not to use this. So, uh, now we moved from this to teacher training, because teacher training is an essential process in the education. Both sides are really trained to teach their own narrative. But how to address history in, into multi-perspectivity and to move from monolithic approach to multi-perspectivity and to address the other side narrative, this is a big challenge. So that's why the, we, use, we continue to train teachers uh, directly, jointly, and separately in both Palestinian and Israeli schools, doing that uh, in, 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 in groups and also in, in sessions that, uh, that whatever is possible. Uh, we, uh, we, now, the book that we produce and we already produce and it's available in many languages is being used as teacher training manual at t teacher training colleges and universities. So it's not if you cannot teach schools and you cannot teach teachers, 
at least you can train teachers who, uh, students who will be potential teachers, and when they finish their university, they, at least they would be able to relate to the others. And we think, as we prime, that part of the conflict is what narrative that we carry with us. And narrative is not part of the past, it's part of what we are now and part of what will be the potential solution in the future uh, as such. So recognizing the existence of different narratives is a process that we work on. Uh, the long t it's a long-term process, it's not a short-term process, but it, it has some kind of tangible present when the t the, some pupils in both sides said, now we understand why the other behaving this way, now we understand that uh, that our narrative is not full. It should it, 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 we should read more, and some of them rejected, of course, the, the acceptance of other narratives, and some of them they are willing to go further and meet the other uh, the children from the other side. Uh, when we talk about uh, uh, from 2000 and 2010, with the second intifada, meeting each other became so difficult. That's why I think uh, the media and using media is a very important role because media can travel cross borders without any limitation. Internet, uh, Facebooks, radio, and also the films that uh, Piece It Together is planning to do, I think it, it will give a chance to the uh, youth and young people not to be also just listening to the others, it's like creating their own narrative and their own share uh, in the future. That's why Prime is, uh, has signed an agreement, a partnership, not agreement, with Piece It Together to, uh, to work on this project for these years. Uh, we have a long way to go. Uh, the system is very difficult on both sides because both sides have a very centralized system of education and education is controlled completely by both ministries of education. But this is what we can do in the meantime. Hopefully this experience will be relevant to post-conflict situation as when we started this process, it should be a post-conflict. We end up doing that in conflict. So hopefully when there is a breakthrough in the political uh, arena, this experience will be valuable uh, to, uh, to be implemented in schools. Okay. Uh, locally and regionally and internationally, because our books are being used in some American school, some European schools, and even some other international uh, uh, institution like in Macedonia, they start using the same format of, of, of the book where we put the Palestinian narrative and the Israeli narrative side by side with the Middle East space so as not to close narrative because narrative is a, is a process where you re relate to the past and to your current situation and the future. Well, thank you. Um, the, I, I'm gaining a sense of optimism here, ladies and gentlemen. As Gerson says, we, I think we, the people directly involved, really do know largely the solutions. And to the final status negotiations in, uh, that came up after Camp David in 2000, it was almost there, it seemed. And water, border, right of return, economic development, uh, even Jerusalem uh, was getting very, very close. Um, and as Sammy says, we're working through education on the historical narrative. But we had an interesting discussion last night over dinner about uh, something perhaps more intractable or maybe something that should be simpler. And that was the basic tenets of the three monotheistic religions are pretty well the same. Can we shift the dialogue to those what is so basic and so common? And, or what's in the way of that when the most complex, the largest solution should be the simplest if we can find the common basis? Or is that foolhardy? Or? I think that um, we have to be very careful. This is a political territorial conflict whose solution is division. You're trying to put on the table things which are not divisible. Faith is not divisible. One of the challenges involved in this conflict is understanding that the roots of the conflict are deeply religious. The historical context is based on holy scriptures. And if we allow religion to overtake the conflict, it becomes intractable. 
The challenge is to understand that people of faith have to often use magnifying glasses and tweezers to pick out the positive messages very quietly because the noise of religion are the, the voices of extremism, particularly in the region where we're living. Religious leaders, religious leaders in the Holy Land, be they Jewish or Muslim, they are not usually the voices of moderation. Unfortunately, religion could pave the path for us to move forward, but that's not our experience with our religious leaders and the establishment religion, religious communities that we have. So we have to understand that we need to address the religiosity of the conflict and the people involved and to keep religion out of the process as much as possible. Sammy? I, I agree with uh, Gershon mostly. And I feel also uh, when, we, when you go to the religion and you go to the belief, it's going to be di divisive. You know, it's not going to be an you know, emerging. You know. But I would say that uh, religious leaders has to be invited in the process and has to play a significant role in what messages they are giving to their beliefs or followers. I wouldn't leave religion, religion and religious leaders away. We have to approach them, we have to engage them in the process. Otherwise, they will continue preaching, telling, uh, indoctrinating their followers with their whatever you know, beliefs and ideology. I would say leaving out religion is, is, a, is, a, is, is, is it has a price. And I think the earlier and the sooner that we engage religious leaders, to engage them in the process, to be part of the negotiation, I think that's the way to invite them and to engage them. I can, I, can, I add, can I add something, Sammy, um, if you allow me? No, in, in Israel and in Palestine, um, clergy are, are um, workers of the state. They receive their salaries from the governments. Yeah. Um, and um, unlike Canada or the United States or other places, there is no real separation between religious and state. Um, religion and state, and, and therefore there is a mechanism of, call it control, or a mechanism of moderation. What's happened in the Palestinian Authority over the past two years, under the leadership of President Abbas and Prime Minister Fayyad, is that they, they fired all the Hamas-affiliated clergy, all the sheikhs who were affiliated to Hamas have been removed of duty and been replaced by others who are loyal to the Palestinian Authority. And every Thursday afternoon, every mosque in the West Bank receives a page of messages which they are asked to uh, uh, expose to talk about in their Friday sermons. And yeah, the but, messages have yeah. often been messages much more of tolerance and of peace. Yes, yes. you know, I think uh, that's one thing which, uh, you know, I would, I would raise uh, suspicions of how successful that, because we cannot move from way of religious people suppress others to another way of suppress also religion. I would like to speak about religion also not one, one style, one level, one page. There are different religious leaders in the Palestinian community. And I know in the Israeli community also the Christian community because that's also part of the whole you know, mosaics, Christian, Muslim, and also Jewish people. And there's the religious council that start to engage in the process. As, as passionate as they are, as hesitant as they are, but they are start establishing the Council of Religion for Peace, they meet, they try to look at each other and try to influence each other. I think we should build on these moves and these level of moderation and try to invite them more and more. And uh, I would say there's two levels. One level which is can be addressed in when the general masses or prayers, whatever, or speeches or sermons. And the other level is how also to to limit their, those extreme religious people from keep infiltrating on the young people. Because that's also mobilizing these young people also to be part of that religious practice. Uh, religion and religious leader has to be part of the process, should be part of the process, in what kind of formula to separate the religious teaching from the deep belief uh, of the religion. That's an, a new formula to be part of the solutions. Uh, if you look at the, you know, uh, whatever, 
a few thousand fraud buyers the other day sign an agreement or make a declaration that, uh, you know, forbidding Israelis to even rent a place to a Palestinian or to approach Palestinian or to live south Palestina. So if that message is continue to be from rabbis, from priests, from sheikh, this means uh, they are hijacking religion, using religion, abusing religion, and trying to influence the political orientation of any, any political solution. There's no way we can continue like, like that. We should put a strategy and a way for moderations of all religions to come and to have the power. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Rina, would you like to pose a last question, and then we'll open it up to a general sure. discussion. Great. Last question has to do with um, <coughs> asking your advice, <laughs> your advice particularly for this audience, uh, an international audience, and you might also um, say what advice you have for students. I'm sure there are many students in this audience as well. So advice for students and for internationals in general, maybe Canadians in specific. <laughs> well, I, I want to throw out a challenge to you sitting in this audience here in Vancouver. Um, I don't know if you know this, but your government in the 1990s was one of the first governments in the world to recognize that it was important to create opportunities for Israeli and Palestinian citizens to meet each other face to face in people to people uh, activities. And the government of Canada created something in the early 1990s called the Dialogue Fund. The Dialogue Fund eventually was adopted by the Canadian Foreign Ministry as it's a policy throughout the world, and they turned it into a global fund called Networking for Peace. And Networking for Peace supported people in conflict areas throughout the world until two years ago. Two years ago, the government of Canada... This was not Canada, a political announcement. <laughs> the government of Canada canceled the Networking for Peace program, which no longer exists not only in Israel and Palestine, but around the world. And you probably don't know this in your Canadian citizens and taxpayers. Um, Canada's not alone. This is a trend around the world who looked at the Israeli-Palestinian conflict with a lot of fatigue and a lot of frustration and said, well, this isn't going anywhere. We might as well put our support somewhere else. And with the exception of a few small programs like uh, piecing it together and a program, a very, very interesting program that you should look at taking place at the University of Windsor, where they have an old city, um, a, a Jerusalem old city project where they've done extraordinary work on, on developing new model for the administration of the old city in peace. You should look at Windsor University old city Jerusalem on Google and you'll find it. With the exception of those two programs, your government is not supporting any peace building activities anymore. The government of Canada is still involved and, and committed to working on the refugee issue. You were the holders of the gavel in the multilateral talks of refugees, and this is a major issue of support for Canada in the future, but right now, we need the support of Canada to continue this work. <coughs> so I know that you're far away from the Middle East, and it's hard to get involved in a daily basis on making a real contribution there, but if you could get your government to seek its interest once again by restarting the Networking for Peace project, then you've done a lot, not only for Israel-Palestine, but for other conflict areas of the world as well. Well, uh, I think uh, the best thing, as I would just follow what Kirsch was saying, you're not far away. I think we recommend you to get engaged, to try to expose yourself and to learn more about the situation and to be, not to continue, um, um, maybe you're not, to continue as a bystander in this conflict. Uh, and uh, meaning, to maybe to visit the area, to try to engage in people-to-people -people, uh, relationship, to write about it, uh, to engage in the process of uh, in, engage or support your constituent, to support your legislative, your representative, to be politically active in the process, and also uh, to be able to write to the media and try to present your opinion to the media. For the students here, I think, and as we talked maybe before, I, I would say maybe a seminar or a course on the Middle East study will be relevant for this campus mm -hmm. to engage or to launch, meaning that a seminar could invite speakers, could invite researchers from Palestine, Israel, from different parts of the world, that to be politically active, 
you know, and politically engage in this process. It's not for the sake of the Palestinian Israeli, which is we, of course, we need it, but it's also for the sake of everybody on this globe. The other thing is continuation of fund, which is really an extreme uh, challenge for us as peace builder, working from the ground, and we need the peace builder. We need publicity, of course, but also we need funds that we could sustain the whatever hopes that we could create by such you know, drops in this ocean. And with your support, morally, financially, media, uh, sympathy, we will be able to continue uh, the work that Kirshen was trying to describe and I was describing. Okay. Thank you very much, all of you. Ladies and gentlemen. What we'd like to do now for the next uh, half hour or so is to invite you to uh, provide comments and to ask direct questions uh, of our guests. We have a microphone on each side, so please feel free to um, approach it and make your comment. What we'll try and do is we'll see how the questions go and how, many, uh, how we're doing. Let's try not to be repetitive or um, go on too long, but so we can get the benefit of our of our guest's uh, experience. Thank you. Hi. Um, Could you ask Gershon, uh, you when I first met you, yes. in, or Excuse first me. heard... Sorry, uh, Dr. Edwan has just asked if we could introduce yourself. Oh, my name is Maxine kaufman Lacusta, and um, I recently published a book called Refusing to be Enemies, Palestinian and Israeli Nonviolent Resistance to the Israeli Occupation. Um, and I lived in Jerusalem for seven years, and towards the beginning of that time, 1989, I believe, um, I first became aware of uh, Gershon's thinking about, I thought, very futuristic thinking about the problems that would have to be dealt with after the two-state solution. And he's, he mentioned water and Jerusalem and refugees and so on, very important problems. What I would like to suggest is that they're not limited to application within a two-state solution, my favorite, and what I think is a lot more feasible at this stage of the game, is something that um, Jeff Halper has tossed out as one possible solution, that is a regional confederation involving Israeli and Palestinian states or statelets, or whatever you want to call them, as well as uh, Jordan, uh, possibly Egypt, uh, Syria, uh, Lebanon, of course, Iraq, etc. And the idea being a kind of loose confederation like the uh, European economic community was where you could live and work in any part but only have uh, citizenship and voting rights in your own segment. It seems to me that would speak to the fears of Israeli Jews, for instance, who are afraid that if they're outnumbered in the vote, then someday their borders might be closed to Jews that need a refuge. And it would also speak to the Palestinians for the right of return to any part of the area. So I'm curious about your, your thoughts about that. I also wanted to... Um, make a, a, a quick comment that I think for the students, uh, there's a lot of programs over there. There's one called uh, Birthright Unplugged, uh, which unlike Birthright Israel isn't limited to Jewish young people, that allows you to see what's going on in Palestine and you can Google that. Um, there are many, many organizations that uh, offer uh, alternative tourism mm -hmm. and uh, that I think is very useful. Uh, so yeah, and also nobody's mentioned Gaza. I'd like to see where that fits into your music. The elephant future. in the room. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Perhaps we'll take, um, if we could, two more, and then our guests can address them all at once. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, first, a comment. Uh, Mr. Baskin finished with a call for, the, for us to pressure the Canadian government to resume funding for dialogue programs. I think the Harper government is probably the least likely in the world to go in that direction because it probably gives unqualified support to the government of Israel unilaterally. Uh, Mr. Owen made a comment about feeling a sense of optimism here. I don't know about everybody else in the room, but from what I've been seeing in the Middle East today, I'm not feeling optimistic. Um, Mr. Baskin made a comment about we have an 18-year-old failed process, we've reached impasse, and what's needed is for the Americans to set the process so that we can shift to a, a focus on substance. I think given the power of the 
Israel lobby organizations like APEC, et cetera, that have the ability to cripple any congressional move in that direction. I feel like that's whistling in the wind to make that call. Uh, when there was so much as a move in the direction of a freeze, which I don't think is unreasonable the way you characterize it, I don't think it's unreasonable for there to be a status freeze while negotiations are going on, because the alternative is to negotiate over the size of the pizza while one side is eating it. And I think that what I'd like to uh, finish my comments with is a question. The Palestinian civil society, frustrated with decades of impasse and worsening crisis on the ground, called in 2005 for the international civil society to step in where international governments are failing to act and mounted a, a call for the mounting of an international campaign of boycott, divestment, and sanctions against the government of Israel to put an end to its impunity to start imposing costs on Israel, which it's not currently paying, in order to end the impasse. And I'd like your comments on the desirability of that and the legitimacy of the call from Palestinian civil society. Thank you. We have about 10 questions there. We'll have one more comment, and then, uh, then we'll go to our guests. Thank you. My name is uh, Azam Wazir, and I'm from uh, Colombo, Sri Lanka. Uh, I'm going to keep this short and sweet. So it was great to see you guys getting along so well up there. Uh, but it just, I'm, I'm just slightly curious if there is anything you guys disagree on. <laughs> Thank you. Anything we disagree on. <laughs> Who would like to begin being disagreeable? Um, th there were, in, in the three questions that were asked, there were about 15. So, so I'm going to be very telegraphic in trying to relate to everything that was said. Like seen on the issue of confederation, um, I'm all in favor of wider regional solutions. Um, and I think there are many of them out there. Um, I had lunch with Yasser Arafat about two months before he died, where he didn't stop talking about trilateral confederation, the Benelux model for the Middle East. And I'm for all those models. I think they're all good. They need to be pursued. This is a wider conflict than just Israel-Palestine and we need to address the entire region. The thing is that confederative models are agreements between sovereign states. Palestinians must achieve sovereignty before someone decides that they should have less than sovereignty. Israel is a sovereign state. Israel is the territorial expression of the Jewish national identity. Palestinians must go through the phase where they have control over their own destiny. They must have a territorial expression for their identity. The day after they achieve that, we can open up negotiations for federation, for confederation, for regional trade agreements and regional cultural agreements and whatever. But we must achieve the two states before we go beyond that. Gaza, the elephant in the room that no one talked about. Gaza will be part of the Palestinian state. Gaza is Palestinian. The Israelis, the Israelis made a tragic error by refusing to realize that their disengagement from Gaza should have been part of a negotiated process. The message of the Israeli unilateral decision to leave Gaza, which I supported leaving Gaza, but through a negotiated process, was that it handed the victory to the extremist. Hamas claimed the victory of the withdrawal of Israel from Gaza because the message was that we are not going to leave through negotiations. We will only leave when you force us to leave. And this was a tragic mistake which led to Hamas taking over first through elections and then through a coup d'etat. But the internal dispute between Hamas and Fatah, or the national movement, is an internal Palestinian dispute and must be resolved by Palestinians, not by Israelis intervening in that dispute. The best way to go about that is by making peace with the Palestinians. And we say that in that peace, Gaza will be included in the implementation of the creation of the Palestinian state when the regime in Gaza is controlled by the Palestinian body with which we sign peace. Today, Hamas is less popular, particularly in Gaza, than at any other time in the past. And there are lots of reasons. One is because they are lousy leaders, and they are not acting in the interest of their people, and Palestinians are not radical extremists. Palestinians are moderate people, and they don't want to be ruled by Taliban. 
But the process of changing the regime in Gaza must be part of a wider process of peacemaking between Israel and, and the Palestinians, not through siege and not through a collective punishment, which only empowers the extremist. So it must be done as part of a peace process, and we go, go on talking about that for a long time. Um, with regard to the Harper government and networking for peace, supporting dialogue programs and peacemaking programs between Israelis and Palestinians is the most pro-Israeli thing that you can do, and that's what I would tell the government of Israel. Here of Canada. Of Canada, sorry. <laughs> Israel too. I said with regard to the United States that unfortunately Obama has been um, very, very disappointing. Uh, we had great hopes and they have not been uh, 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 brought forward. We haven't seen fruition of the hopes that we had in Obama. And I don't have a lot of confidence that the Americans are going to lead the way. I don't know if you understood for me that I thought that they would. I said, this is what they should do. They're not doing it. I don't think they're going to do it. And that's why I strongly support the efforts of what the Palestinian Authority doing, is doing today, of building their state from the bottom up, of creating a new reality in the occupied territories, of gaining the recognition of the international community, of using the United Nations, and compelling Israel to recognize the fact that it has no choice but to recognize Palestine. Israel should be the first country to recognize Palestine, it will be the last, unfortunately. If but it, it will happen, because there is no other choice. Um, with regard to AIPAC and Congress, foreign policy in the United States is determined by the President. He has to deal with Congress, and he has to deal with groups by AIPAC, but if President Obama was determined to move forward with a peace process negotiation, Congress can only issue statements of, of, of uh, declaration and, and not compel the President to stop negotiating peace between Israel and Palestine and bringing it about. So AIPAC is a problem, but we also have J Street, and we have other, other forces in the American Jewish community, and let's face it, Jews in America, with all the strength that they may have, are a very small, small minority in the United States, and one of the differences that gave me hope, at least with regard to President Obama, is that he's the first U.S. president who said that the resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a U.S. national security interest. Not just an interest of the parties, but it's a U.S. national security interest. And if that's so, then I expect him to take action on it. Settlement freeze. In, it is certainly necessary and certainly should be done. And I said it was an obligation of the State of Israel, not from yesterday, but from the roadmap. And it should have been done in the beginning of the peace process when they began negotiating peace, because if you're intending to build a Palestinian state, then why are you continuing to build settlements on it? What I did say <coughs> is that by uh, putting the settlement issue up front as a precondition for the peace process, you have transformed the process from substance to process. Because the real issue, as I tried to say, is the issue of the border, not the issue of building settlements. Uh, if you build another thousand housing units in the settlement of Gilo, which is part of Jerusalem, you're not going to change any reality on the ground because Gilo is never going to be part of the Palestinian state. So that should not be the issue. I understand why it's an issue. Building settlements is illegal by international law. It should not be done. But if your focus is going to be on the issues that are not going to determine the final output, the final outcome of the negotiations, then don't do it. Focus on getting to the final status agreement. That's what I was saying. And lastly, with regard to BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions, um, I think that the, uh, that the statements made by the Palestinian leaders, by Mahmoud Abbas and Sayyid Barikat and Salam Fayyad and others, is very useful and very helpful. They have said, we, the Palestinian Authority, boycott settlements. And therefore, they have made it illegal within the Palestinian Authority areas to trade in settlement products. But if you walk into any shop in Ramallah, or Bethlehem, or Tokaram, or Kalkilia, you will see the shops filled with Israeli products. Because their message is that we are not against Israel, we are against occupation. And I think if you support a general boycott, divestment, sanction campaign against the State of Israel, you are giving the wrong message. You are giving the message that the existence of Israel is illegitimate, and that's not the message, unless you believe it. I don't. I think that the existence of Israel is legitimate, 
And I think that by supporting a two-state solution, we're saying that we want to end the Israeli occupation over the territories occupied by Israel in 1967, and the focus there should be on boycotting the occupation, not boycotting Israel. Well, that, that was an impressive exercise in note-taking. <laughs> Um, Sammy, would you like to address this? Well, issue? this is maybe I disagree with the Gershon part of what he said, <laughs> if, you wanna, if you want to find this agreement. <laughs> it's really, uh, I know the issue of boycotting Israel and the settlements is an issue and uh, the experience of South Africa and how much effect that done. Though I myself am against boycotts, but I'm, I'm really again, you know, for putting pressure on the Israeli government not to freeze, not to, in, to expand, but stop settlements. Settlements are illegal. Even Gilo is illegal settlement, because Gilo it was built on 1967 lands, and it's illegal. Yes, Israel is looking for Greater Jerusalem, which Greater Jerusalem could take the whole West Bank, but settlements illegal. Period. How to deal with the issue of settlements? That's another issue. And by the way, Israeli never stopped or expanding settlements, even in the time where there was saying there's freeze of settlements. Because I did a, re a very simple research asking some Palestinian, do you still work? He said, yes. Where do you work on this? The, the, does uh, the import and export of especially the, the precious Palestinian asset, which is the stones, still continue to be you know, sent to the uh, Israeli building settlements? So settlement never stopped. It's only propaganda, it's only media. And settlements sometimes, you don't see them in the street, you see them behind the, 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 the heads, and you know that, and you know that. For a Palestinian, I'd like to have a Palestinian state. I don't care what else. What next that comes in that time? I need a Palestinian state where I can exercise my right as a human being and with full identity. Whatever Jeff Halber, which I know very well, whatever formula that can be presented before establishing a Palestinian state, forming a Palestinian political identity with full exercise, I don't care about that my, my, myself. That could come later. We, we cannot be like Europe. Europe, they went into war hundreds of years, but they still hundreds of years until they reach this EU, and the EU will not be sustained. I disagree also with, I would disagree with also with, uh, with Gershon, I think the, the American foreign ministry is so much controlled and so much uh, influenced by uh, you know, interest group in the United States. There's, you cannot understand the American policy while the American foreign policy has taken firm stand toward any conflict except they fell short when they come to the Palestinian state, and that's because of the, uh, the I think, the influence of interest group there. Uh, the issue of, the issue, uh, of boycott, it's becoming also an internal Palestinian discussions. And I am, as Palestinian, also was pressured to boycott Israeli academics and not to work with Israelis because Israelis and they have, they have reason. I respect different opinions, and we should create this democracy among the Palestinians. The, the Israelis all serve in the army. The Israelis part of you know, gaining so much of also the continuation of occupation. But for my, and, and of course there is a list that you can go with the civil society that started in 2005. For me, I think it would be much more shorter and much more easier to work with Israeli face to face in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, everywhere. We have to continue dialoguing. We have to continue. The Israeli government built the wall. And one of the reasons, political reason, one of the reasons I could say also, not also to forbid Palestinians from developing their viable state, also maybe to refrain Palestinian Israeli from communicating, because I think I, I would imagine that the Israeli government or part of the Israeli they don't like what has been really done in the ground. So by isolating people, by building walls, psychological wall, human wall, physical wall, it only creates hatred and pain and create enmity and suspicion, etc. And that's not, it will, long, it will prolong the conflict, whatever. 
I think we came so close in, to, in, the, in the 90s, and we don't want to repeat that. And hopefully the wall will fall tomorrow, if it's not yesterday or the day after. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's, 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 that message, I think, of boycotting settlement on settlements, that's another issue at the political level. But for myself, I, I'm really for continued dialoguing, continue creating possibilities, continue humani humanizing each other in the course of the conflict. Though the international community should take a stronger and infiltrate and put so much effort in resolving the conflicts. I mean the American, I mean the European, and Canadian as well. Well, thank you both. And I, I know there are a lot of questions, and I hope that some of them are overlapping. But um, Hi, yes. so uh, my name is Ido. I'm Israeli. I have a couple of questions as an Israeli. First, thanks for the presentation. Um, so one of the, so you raised many opinions, many facts. Uh, one of the assumptions that seemed to be under the surface was that both sides want progress and want peace, so that then there is a solution. And as an Israeli, I'm not sure that the Israeli society or leadership really want peace. Um, and maybe it's partially because it doesn't seem that Israel is paying a price for the occupation. And I think that when I talk to many of my friends and family, they think that the price of peace is higher than the price of occupation, uh, both economically and also with, well, the world seems to be really aligned behind Israel, at least passively acknowledge uh, the occupation. So I wonder whether you agree with this analysis, and if so, what could be done? Uh, the other question that is somewhat related, really short, is that uh, you presented some very uh, promising uh, uh, progress on civil environmental issues. I have some Palestinian friends who actually say that this is counterproductive because there are some real issues such as a Palestinian state. And by making progress on other issues, we create a, um, a sense of progress, which is not realistic. And it, it puts everyone off guard. So what do you think about that too? So thank you. Thank you. My name is uh, Mahmoud Ahmouz and I'm a Palestinian refugee. My question is actually slash concern is for the Palestinian side. I think that by you taking part in this event, you are giving the false impression that the two sides are equal when in fact one is occupying the other. All over the world, the situation is portrayed as this conflict where two sides just need to get along when in fact it is not. The fact is that one side is oppressing the other to the point where some have described the state of Israel as an apartheid state. So talking about peace is useless when you are under the longest military occupation in the history of humankind. Instead, we should be talking about ending the occupation first because recognizing people's right for self-determination is a prerequisite for peace. So please, Dr. Edwin, tell me, what exactly are you trying to achieve by being here and talking about peace while Israel is building settlements and killing civilians? I find that to be very shameful. So please, enlighten me. Yes, sir. Yeah, I, I, I'll just have one more question in the morning. I'm Shiraz. I'm an educator and a pacifist, and I work with grandparents. So I don't want to ask you a question of what raging granny is doing in in Middle East in terms of promoting peace. But if you want to talk about it, fine. But my question is that uh, I I see that a lot of Palestinians who come to live in Canada they are called Palestinian Canadians. But when the Israelis come to Canada, they often reclaim their Russian identities, so they'll become Russian, Palestinian, Russian Canadians, or French Canadians, or Scottish Canadians, or Netanyahu, I think, was called Polish Canadian, and he came to see the Prime Minister. And our Prime Minister is often talking about Canada being part of Israel, or Israel being part of Canada in terms of uh, their love relationship. So I don't know what, who are the Israelis, I mean, because it seems there is a large Russian community, there is a large other European communities, and often we see the Russian foreign minister contradicting with Netanyahu and so on. So can you tell us uh, the, the ethnic conflict within the, the Jewish community, and can we say the Jewish are more Jewish than the national identity? Thank you. And you can talk about raging granny. <laughs> thank you, sir. Which one would you like to do? Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mahmoud, for your, I think, comments, which is, 
Yes, you're right, absolutely right. Maybe I didn't have the chance to explain myself from the beginning. My overall aim using this approach of peace building is to end the Israeli occupation and to have a Palestinian state and to respect for Palestinian national and Latin and national rights, including the right of, of return for refugees. This is no question about it. There's no compromise about it. And the Israeli knows my position whenever I meet. These are the basic, basic elements and basic rights for the Palestinians to have their dignity, freedom, ending the occupation, etc., etc. The asymmetric situation that exists Unfortunately, I also overlooked it because in the morning I spoke about it. Sometimes when you give two speeches in the same day, <laughs> you overlap, you overlook things. In the morning, I explain in my presentation the asymmetry that exists. I'm a Palestinian, I'm patriot like you, maybe less than you. I believe in my rights and I have the right to be in Palestine and to fight for my state to be established free from occupation, free from settlement, free from any kind of indoctrination. Now I choose uh, doing that through the process of working, what we call it, bottom up, uh, and trying to create and uh, trying to build the infrastructure of that. It doesn't mean, as a Palestinian who lost three relatives, killed by the Israeli society that I could forget that this is our basic rights. But, you know, living here in Canada, that's one thing, you can live far away. I'm, I agree that with your political view, I respect that, I respect it also. You know, I respect as much different opinion and different approach. But my, myself, living inside the occupied territory, and I still call it occupied territory, and in the morning I mentioned that. We are not in Palestine, independent Palestinian state. We're not in, we, we used to see PNA, PA, and Palestine. Now, in the last few years, I call it Palestinian occupied territory. And I, I, I hope you understand also the Canadian. Palestinians still living under occupation. There's no equality. This complete asymmetry that exists between the both sides. The issue how to approach this and how to address this, this is we, we can be different, right? which is, that's fine. But this is our basic rights. And Gershon and other Israelis also share this kind of view, and many Israelis share this position that the Palestinians should be uh, free, should have their independent states. There's no question about it. Uh, I hope, I hope uh, that what, I, what I'm trying to say is, is clear and loud that I am against using violence or power or military ways of liberating myself. And this is myself. You could disagree, anybody could say. I am for using negotiation and the process of you know, compromises in reaching our End, which is two-state solution and two-state living side by side. The Palestinian paid so much price in this and part of my motivation is how to stop the humiliation of the Palestinian. And if I can succeed also, get, helping the Israeli getting rid of these occupation mentality. I could also, I would, I would like to say we can feed two birds with one move. I don't want to say kill two birds with two stones. <laughs> the Israeli also are so much obsessed and just to reply to some of the comments and yes, uh, they gain so much from the occupation. They are the building the wall and they, as, you, as Gershon was saying, the Palestinian market, if you go to Tarkumia, or if you go to Beit Lahem, or if you go to any place, most of the Palestinian product, the product that sell, are sold in the Palestinian market are Israelis, you know, Nova or other things. So how, how to really balance between the asymmetric situation that we live under, as Palestinian personally being inflicted, 
and trying to go over that and bridge and try to see one way that a two-state solution, a peaceful solution should come. Now, tomorrow, yesterday, this is what we hope for. Yeah, um, yeah. I will. I'll just stop there. I, I just. I completely agree with you. I respect your opinion too, very much. And that's some Palestinian democracy. And I should say it: if the four Palestinians are in the room, there will be five political parties. <laughs> you know, and you know the rest. We we say if you have two Jews in the room, they'll build three synagogues. Okay. Ido. <laughs> um, a majority of Israelis and a majority of Palestinians want peace. This is very clear from every piece of public opinion research that's been done over the last decade, including we're, we're very um, surveyed societies. Every day there are surveys that are published on every issue that you can imagine, and this is consistent. A majority of people want peace, but what does that mean? Um, the, the more you dissect the research, and ask specific questions, you'll get smaller and smaller numbers on, on what that means, of what price people are willing to pay for peace. Um, we've been trapped in the peace process by political leaders who enlist themselves to public opinion research, which they often uh, initiate in order to handcuff themselves from not moving forward. What we need to recognize is that leaders shape public opinion, they don't follow public opinion. And this is the problem that we have. I would say categorically today, from my intimate um, knowledge and, and, and knowing on a one-to-one -one basis, all the leaders on the Israeli side and on the Palestinian side, that there is a Palestinian partner for peace today. The leadership of Palestine is committed and dedicated to the two-state solution along the lines that I uh, mentioned before, with a commitment not to return to violence. The current government of Israel is clearly not a partner for peace. And this has to be said categorically as well. Prime Minister Netanyahu and his right-wing religious government that he leads is not on the path to peace. Now this has to compel us Israelis who understand that the future of our state, the future, if you will, of the Zionist enterprise is based on our ability to end the occupation over the Palestinian people. Because not only are the Palestinian people occupied by us, our state, our freedom, our democracy, our ability to be the kind of state that we should be is occupied by this occupation. We need to free ourselves from the occupation. This is not an endless game. There is a ticking time clock on this. And in my view, the ticking time clock is linked to the ability and the sustainability of the current Palestinian leadership, which is our partner for peace. I don't know exactly when that time clock ends, but it's soon. I would say it's probably sometime during the course of 2011. And I have never, in the 30 years that I've been working for peace, talked about an, a deadline. We are facing a deadline now, because when the leadership of President Abbas and Salam Fayyad and the other leaders of the PLO today can no longer sustain themselves in front of their people saying, we're going to deliver you peace and liberation and freedom, the competition for the next generation of Palestinian leaders is not going to be amongst those who are competing on a basis of moderation but competing on a basis of extremism, and we will lose the opportunity to create the two-state solution, which means that we, as Israelis and Jews and Zionists, will lose the ability to have a state of Israel that will be a democratic state. And then we enter into a period of a new struggle, and, and it's a struggle that I will be compelled to join, even though I don't want to now. It will be the struggle for making sure that the one-state solution is a democratic state. I don't want to be there because it's going to be very bloody. It's the transformation of this conflict, which is resolvable, into Bosnia. It's going back to an existential conflict where it's no longer how to divide the land, but who controls it. And then for those of you who use the apartheid linguistics, it will be a struggle of apartheid, not as it is today. We have to avoid being there. We have to do everything possible in the months ahead 
to make sure that the Palestinian state is established, that the Palestinians, if they have to do it unilaterally, do it because this is the only way to save Israel as well, not only the Palestinians. Mahmoud, there is no doubt that this is not a conflict on a symmetrical basis. There is an occupier and there is an occupied. But don't you forget for a moment that there is total symmetry in suffering. My wife's first cousin was kidnapped and killed by Hamas. His children, who are orphans, are no less orphans than the Palestinian children whose parents were killed. So there is a symmetry at the human level, not at the political level. And because of that, we have to end the conflict. Um, <laughs> who are the Israelis? We can have a whole semester course on who is the Israelis. In, in one sentence, Israel is an immigration country, the country of immigrants. And it's a society whose identity is being shaped every day by the people who constitute it. And every day this entity is emerging and identity is developing and that's one of the really fascinating places and intriguing things about living in Israel. It's that it's such a mosaic of cultures and of sounds and shapes and smells and food and, and, and I think societies that are not immigrant societies are boring. This is an immigration, an immigrant society. What is so compelling and interesting about Vancouver is the multi-diversity that exists in this room, in this campus, in this city. Those are the places in the world that are interesting to live in. So it's true, we have a foreign minister of this type and a, and a, and a, and a minister of interior of another type and people of, that's what's really interesting about it. And, and I, I'm fascinated by it. And, and we'll see how it develops. And everyone has a piece of the, you know, everyone's throwing in some spice into the pot that's cooking. And we'll taste it as it goes along, and hopefully it will taste good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we're on this side now. If we could keep um, these quite short and pointed, and we'll try and do a couple more rounds, and then we're going to see the Piece It Together film and be finished by 9.30, as we promised. Thank you. Um, all right. Okay, I'll try to keep this quick. Uh, I'm Alex Majeri. I'm from Winnipeg, but I'm a student here at UBC. And tonight there's been a lot of talk about where we want to end up. We want to end up with this two-state solution with very well-defined ideas of Israel and Palestine coexisting in peace. That's great. I think it's safe to say that's what everybody wants. However, getting there, I don't think it's been talked about a lot. I don't want to sound like a broken record, but the elephant in the room is Gaza. Israel isn't going to really consider any serious peace decision unless they can feel safe with Gaza right beside them and they feel that that problem has been taken care of. And I was just wondering what kind of possible solutions do you see for Gaza because the Palestinian Authority and Hamas aren't exactly on speaking terms and the Israelis and Hamas are more likely to bomb each other than talk to each other. And there doesn't seem to be any mediators in the region who could help, like the Egyptians, for example, they're, he they're hesitant to take any refugees from the Gaza Strip, let alone step in to help. So how do you think the problem of Gaza could conceivably be solved? Because before we can get peace, we have to get rid of the biggest obstacle in the way. Thank you. Sammy? Well, um, um, Gaza is part of the Palestinian territory. It should be part of the Palestinian states. Now the internal conflicts uh, that happened between, I would say, the PN, the PA, the PA, the PNA, the authority in, 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 in the West Bank and Gaza, it has its own reasons. And the, one of the reasons I would say that the deadlock in the peace process. If there is a peace process and there is a comprehensive peace agreement, I think this internal conflict could be soothed down gradually, slowly. Now, uh, there's rounds of negotiation and talks between the Fatah, mainly, and Hamas leaders. And uh, we, I think the one, the reasons is not being successful is the intervention from the outside interests, political states. I don't want to name any, any, any state now. I, I, I the, 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 if there are, if there are a process, it's not a process, it is a comprehensive peace yes. process. 
really that people see the lights that they will be ending occupation, the issue of Gaza will come. Would it that come before peace agreement or after peace agreement? I think also the people of Gaza are fed up from the system. I read a lot of articles coming out from Gaza uh, expressing their disagreement or disenchantment with the system and they need a change. How to bring the change? Israeli has to, uh, to, to, to play a role in that, not to intervene because the intervention of the, of the, of the Israeli will create only difficult problem. Um, but a peace process that, that, which was part of the plan anyway. The discontinuity between Gaza and the West Bank by uh, Israel, uh, the, was, the plan was to build a train between the West Bank and Gaza to make continuity, a safe passage, whatever you name it. This train, if Israeli has agreed to it, the discontinuity between Gaza and the West Bank would be much uh, easier to handle. I, I, would, I would like to mention that also a lot of people, Palestinians from Gaza are living in the West Bank too, and a lot of Palestinians from the West Bank living in Gaza. So it's not complete Gaza and the West Bank. There's a mixture you know, of, uh, of that. Um, it's a problem, it's an internal Palestinian problem. But the, the impasse in the reaching peace agreement only a lot. There's intervention from some countries which is created reaching a peaceful agreement. Israel is using, is being used that, exaggerated in some way or the others. Yes, there is sort of, you know, missiles being thrown here, there, and homemade missiles versus Apache and versus F-16, etc. So the asymmetry, going back to the asymmetry. But still, I think a secure Israeli state will not be seen unless a full Palestinian independent state be established. And that's the most guarantee for Israeli secure state by establishing a Palestinian state, an independent Palestinian state in both Gaza and the West Bank. Thank you. Christian, I think we'll uh, go allow to me, Allow me to be right. rude if you, I know it's not done in Canada, but um, the argument that Gaza is an obstacle to peace is BS. Gaza is a territory, a tiny territory, with 1.6, 1.7 million people, most of who are living under the poverty line as defined by the United Nations. This is not the kind of hunger you find in in Africa, um, but it's a, it's a population of people who are educated, a population of people who are motivated, who are entrepreneurial, and if we're allowed to work, would be working very hard to build a better future for themselves. Uh, I worked for years with the farmers in Gaza in developing the export market of strawberries and flowers to go to Europe. These are the most talented farmers that I know in the entire Middle East. Uh, and if they were allowed to export freely, they would be very wealthy. Gaza is being held hostage because of a political decision that Palestinians made, an unfortunate one at the time of elections, for various reasons. And don't be disillusioned or misinformed about a majority of Palestinians supporting Hamas not in Gaza and not in the West Bank because Hamas did not win a majority. Hamas won about 35% of the vote because of the political system and the circumstances of the elections. They won the elections, but Hamas did not have a majority. They had about a third, but they won the elections. And they're being punished because the Hamas won the elections. And Hamas managed through military means to take over the Gaza Strip and throughout the Palestinian Authority. If this is any kind of military challenge for Israel, then we're in big trouble in Israel. If fighting a bunch of guerrillas with homemade rockets serves any kind of existential threat to Israel, then Israel is in a lot bigger trouble than anyone thinks. So let's not exaggerate the propaganda of the threat of Gaza or Gaza holding back peace from Israel. Choices are made for various reasons during the war in Gaza. For good or for bad, if Israel wanted to, it could have rounded up the whole entire Hamas leadership. It knew exactly where it was. It could have arrested them or killed them. They chose not to do it. They did other things. 
They chose not to do it because the price tag of doing that would have been the total reoccupation of Gaza, and Israel doesn't want the responsibility to feed uh, 1.7 million people in Gaza. But the occupation over Gaza continues. After the uh, disengagement from Gaza, Israel left, removed its settlements, removed the armies, locked the gate, but continued to troll, control the external borders, continued to control the coastal waters, and the airspace in Gaza remained occupied even after Israel left it. So the struggle for the freedom of Gaza didn't end with the Israeli disengagement. And those of you who think that the Palestinians should have celebrated and say victory because the Israelis left Gaza, the Israelis did not leave Gaza. And the struggle didn't end. Gaza is, as I said before, part of the issues which are all resolvable. Whether or not Gaza is connected to the West Bank by a train, a tunnel, a bridge, or on another road, all these options have been looked at, they've been calculated, the engineering designs have been made. 40 kilometers is the distance between Gaza and the West Bank. If someone wants to convince me that a 40 kilometer disconnect is the reason why we can't peace, have peace, then I don't understand anything. This is not an issue. The issue of Gaza being the blockage between peace and not peace is propaganda. So let's not make things that are not substantive into the substantive issues. We have to focus on what's real. Dealing with Hamas, as I said, is an internal Palestinian matter. The challenge before us is how to reduce Hamas to its real size. Palestinians are not fanatics. Hamas's ideology does not represent more than 15% of the Palestinian people. And the challenge is, do we empower Hamas and give them control, or we disempower them by empowering the moderates and making sure that the moderates achieve victory? That's what we have to do. Thank you, Vishen. Now, we're getting on, and I'm, I'm very sorry that for people who've been waiting, but we're going to have just one and two uh, more comments, if we may, and then we'll have to go on with the end of the program. I'm sorry that we can't uh, stay all night. But, yes, ma'am. Uh, my name is Jessica Carpinoni, and um, I started a group at Carleton University two years ago called uh, Students Against Israeli Apartheid. Um, Mr. Baskin, you brought up the issue of the fact that there's a timeline, and um, in order for negotiations to be successful, this is our moment. Um, I want to, we've spoken about Gaza, but Gaza is the other timeline, and I think it's a more sensitive one. There are people who are literally starving. Not true. They're Not true. Ex may I finish? Thanks. Let me correct myself. In order for people in Gaza not to starve, they have to build tunnels to get themselves into Egypt illegally so that they can get food and fuel. Um, now, frankly, I'm really shocked and disgusted that we've spent so much time talking about negotiations when there's a human price here that's being paid as we speak. People in Gaza are dying. People are, Palestinians are still being murdered to this day. Um, two years ago in January, 1,400 people in Gaza were killed. Um, now, if we actually want to talk about how to be effective, I was just a student up until two months ago. So if there's any students in the audience, the question was posed, what can students do? Students can start with um, implementing boycott campaigns in their universities and in their communities. The boycott campaign is nonviolent. It's a very just and peaceful way to put pressure on Israel. The panel seems to agree that Israel is doing many wrongs. And it's pretty clear that after 62 years, talking to Israel is not going to make it do the right thing. Now, the boycott campaign has three very simple principles that I think everyone can agree on. One is equality within Israel. Two is the end to the occupation. And three is the right of return for refugees. This is not anything revolutionary or radical. This is something that I think everyone in this room and in Canada puts, um, you know, values. So. For any students, I would recommend, from my personal experience, I've seen more progress being made by implementing these campaigns than could ever be done by talking about it. So, thank you. Hey, I'm, I'm sorry this is going to be the last comment and then we'll have a response. And then we have another part of the program to get to. Thank you. 
Yes, um, my name is Raymond Hall, and uh, I was in 1969. I got an appointment with, <coughs> excuse me, with, with the United Nations, uh, with UNRWA, specifically with the agency UNRWA, and um, that appointment was um, based not so much on my uh, uh, television and filmmaking skills but on the fact that I was a Canadian citizen. Because at the time, in 1969, um, British nationals and American nationals and probably nationals for other countries could not travel across the Lebanese, I was based in Beirut, Lebanese border into um, Syria or into um, um, Israel, of course. And, and so they needed a a person with North American television experience to make documentaries for UNRWA and other UN agencies, and a Canadian fit, fitted the bill. When I was working in the, in the refugee camps, most of the people that I came in contact with came, were from Ireland or Norway or Sweden. There, weren't, there were no Americans, of course, and no Brits because they weren't allowed. Um, and my question is actually for you, uh, Stephen. Um, Gershon mentioned that the Canadian government has ceased to support um, peacemaking activities that existed around the world. Do you think, Stephen, that in the upcoming election, whenever that is, that the um, question of anti-Semitism, which has been now a parliamentary committee of the government, do you think that's going to be an election issue? Well, I think um, when Gershon mentioned that the only 35% of the people of Gaza supported Hamas, um, we have a comparison, a parallel situation in Canada. Um, <laughs> So I think, um, and I really, I don't mean to be glib, but I think that we live in a very vibrant democracy and we can debate these issues fully and we can uh, have recourse to courts and to electoral processes. And so we have to speak and we can speak uh, at the next election and make this an election issue, um, whether the various leaderships of the various parties want to make it an issue, we can make it an issue. And I think, and so, so thank you for the question. I, I, I just feel very grateful to live in a country where we can actually make these decisions ourselves, um, but we've got to stand up and make them. And so that would be my answer. Now, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for all of this vibrant debate and questioning and, and commentary. Um, we're going to ask Greena now to um, address the, this extremely important, valuable uh, issue of Piece It Together. And even though it's small, and even though it's been going now for two cycles, and we're going into the, the third of this peace education and, and filmmaking, um, it is an immensely powerful force and uh, element in our society. And if we can model what's being done amongst the Canadian Palestinian and Israeli uh, youth and older through these small programs more broadly in society and internationally, that clearly is a way to, uh, to peace. So, Rena. Um, thanks so much. Um, I just first want to say that for those of you who have seen Piece It Together films before, unless you saw this, saw films today at um, a student session, you have not seen the film that we're going to show. It's, uh, it's a new one. <laughs> so that's a treat for those of you who like the films. Um, um, Piece It we, Together is a program that empowers youth to promote peace through dialogue, filmmaking, and multimedia. We work with youth because even in uh, situations and environments where people don't want to listen to each other and don't want to hear things, people do tend to want to listen to youth. Um, we work with filmmaking and multimedia because we also are worried about how do you impact the, a, a large amount of people in a short amount of time. and our, our dream is that the films that, that the youth who come together create, that they actually, that at least one of them, you know, is that one that, that cracks this conflict open. Um, we are 
so thrilled to be working with UBC this ne uh, for our next program. Our next program is going to be in the summer of 2011. And the, the sh film I'm going to show tonight is made by Canadian youth, and it shows about the program, but from their perspective and what they got out of it. The reason I've chose this film tonight is because the Canadian delegation application process has just opened up. So I'm hoping to motivate um, the students in the audience or people who know students in the audience to um, apply for the program. The program this next round is for university or college students, but priority will be given to UBC students between the ages of 20 and 25. So I will stop there. I will show the film, and then I'll talk maybe another two minutes at max um, about the program. Thank you. You find more similarities with the people that you're with for just three weeks than people that you've known your whole life. There was a jigsaw laid out and there was one piece left and I was that piece. It was this wild, crazy teenage experience on the one hand and on the other. Just hit with all sorts of emotions. It was this incredibly serious, heartbreaking. It's impossible to completely explain. It felt like, like it was meant to be. That's what made it the best three weeks of my life. summer I attended this camp on Long Island called Pieces Together and it was to bridge the gap between Palestinians and Israelis. Officially what we were supposed to do is empower ourselves through dialogue and multimedia. So we spent two weeks in official dialogues. There was definitely a lot of confusion um, as to what the Palestinian national cultural identity was and what the rights of the Jewish people or the Israeli people and the Palestinian people were and what, what relation they had to each other. Who was right um, and who was wrong or who was right and who was right in some cases. 11,000 person in prison, do you know what that means? And one person from you, you make all big deal. big deal. You can't say it's not a big deal that a soldier was kidnapped. You just can't say that. I won't accept yeah. that you called suicide bomber a uh, freedom fighter. Why did you kill the people in Deir Yassin? Why did you kill the people Why in Kufur Qasem? Why did you kill the people in Hebron? You say it's afraid and you are, we are afraid, 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 um, but, but in, the, in the other side, the Palestinians die, 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 die. It's a bit rough, I mean, in, in my, uh, my friend's dad just got killed on a missile and we took it, we all took it really hard. And, um, but that's life. And you know how, how it feel like when you wake up every day and you know that you are not free to go to anywhere or to do anything you want to do? Fighting is the easiest way out. Sort of just keep on doing it. You can always keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. And yeah, they attacked us. Let's attack them. And you know, it takes a lot of strength and a lot of courage to, to try to find a solution. In November 1948, you think? There's a man who said, I now pronounce a Jewish country in Israel. Since then, Israel become a Jewish country. Who's that man who said you? you have the... What do you mean? Who's, Who's that man? David ben There's some people, David ben their responsibility is okay. to decide which, which people deserve a country and which other. The, in your opinion, do you think the Australian people deserve a life more than the Palestinian? Deserve country. Say you just say, say, that. You say that. You say that. I just said there's there's people who do job. It's I'm hey, sorry. Please. Maybe. I I'm from 1948 lands. I am I live here. I live in a refugees camp now. Did you know what's the meaning of this? Uh, the soldiers all time, all time, all time. Uh, Treat us like uh, the, uh, he is the soldier, he, he have the power, he have the control. I am under control. Go right, go left, don't, uh, don't cross the street, go to your home, bring your ID. Just like this. They treat us like this. No more, no less. Every day the, uh, the soldiers come to my village and shooting everybody. And you know, a lot of, a lot of problems. There was hitting the door, you know, and my sister, Dima, you know her, you know her, was so scared and my, my mother just closed the door on me because she, want, she don't want me to come out because I'm, when, I, when, I'm, when I see them, I, talk, I speak with them strongly and say why and like this and they don't like that. I'm from, I I'm from I-19. I understand that you're yeah, your but life is miserable and you live under yeah. 
such a bad conditions. I understand you and one hundred percent. But you came and said you came to Palestine and you just you did it to us like that. This you didn't came like okay, we're looking for a country, Palestine. Let's get take all the people off and live there. No, there was a vote. No, it's not what happened. Mohammed had a point that he didn't get to say earlier. If we had just dialogues and finish, I think no one will hear about what we did, what we had. But in film, in something like this, it's going to be forever and everyone can see it and we can affect people. Well, we started off by uh, plotting out the screens and plotting out what we were going to do. Then we had a day of filming, which took place in a lumber yard, <laughs> but it actually does look quite like a checkpoint from the pictures I've seen. Uh, then we spent a lot of time editing, a lot of sleepless nights at the computer. We looked like vampires by the end. Well, in the last two days, I've had about three hours of sleep. Last night, I went to bed at six in the morning. A lot of people get up at that time. We're all a little bit tense. Can I watch it now? Are you ready for me to watch it? But there is still not the uh, sound of why. The voice. Uh, what are you guys doing? We need five minutes. We had to establish something that was really symbolized, I think, embodied by the film. Because, I mean, you talk about peace and you talk about finding peace. But what makes Peace Together so unique is that at the end of the camp you have a physical product. You have this film that you can show to other people and say this is what we made this is the piece we made together and we have like my side which is like me in the front and lots of people behind me which is basically the metaphor for like my country and on the other side the same thing as Muhammad so basically then and as we get look closer to the to the piece together camp so we start to walk towards each other and then like we're like hugging whatever and then like in one, like this, a wall comes down. So, it starts with um, a young child, and he or she <laughs> is carrying a big, big load of rocks or like a heavy thing, trudging along through the countryside, and then all of a sudden people start to come up, all sorts of different people, and take one of the stones or luggage that she he is carrying, take it off her back, carries it as well. And when they take it off her back and start to carry it, they start to tell their story about things that have happened to them in the conflict or about their lives. I want to show you the risk. Life is a risk. We need to be able to fight this and start to fight against the war. We functioned really well and we got really close. We spent hours and hours and hours talking about um, what we wanted our characters to wear and where we wanted to film and how beautiful everything was going to be. And then, of course, we had your natural moments of despair when we realized that we had about seven hours left until the screening and we weren't quite done yet. Look, she's doing something that she's not supposed to do. She told me this I can do it. This is how you ruin the movie, I you see? Can. This is the way that you ruin the movie. I Let did me show you how you do it. Let me no. show you how you're supposed to do it. Uh, um, in the end, it all worked out. We had, of course, that incredible moment of euphoria when we realized that we were done, that we'd finished it, and that we were going to show our film to people, and that it was just something we could we could watch later on and say, yeah, we did this. We're screaming. Everyone's so excited. Yeah. When I was making my film, I wanted to make the greatest film ever made. And that was, perhaps that was why so much of it was so stressful, is that I wanted it to be the greatest film. And I think 
I was very proud of my film when I finished it. But at the same time, I saw everyone else's film, and I was amazed and proud, in a way, of everyone else's film. three weeks that I spent in a bubble of understanding and learning and friendship. And since then, I've looked at the world with new eyes because I understand that there are people out there that care. There are people out there that want to change the world and it's not just some crazy idea I have. I'd, I'd always sort of been all over the place, little fragments of Ryan here and there in, in the art scene or in the activism scene. And I guess the connection that was made is that I could, com I could combine all of these things and really work towards making the world a better place. And as cheesy as that sounds, I think it's true that you, you can dedicate your life to doing something that's just good for yourself and for other people. And that's really what's most important to me right now. I didn't know as much as I thought I did. And I learned from the other Canadians a willingness to learn. I don't actually think like peace is what united us all. I think it was like hope and hope for peace because because the idea of peace like one state solution two state solution it was different for different people and uh, but it was just like the idea of not even the idea that not even thinking that there could be peace but the desire for peace looking back I think that peace together is one of the experiences that I draw on when I need to find um, a place of strength in myself or, well, a place of peace in myself. In addition to the hard work that we do in this camp, there's a lot of fun, okay? And sometimes it might look a little silly. <laughs> Where's the bread? what Peace Camp has brought us to. Pieces! <laughs> that was terrible. I promise two minutes. Um, there's a huge diversity of uh, opinions in this room that, we, that was evident tonight. If you're of the opinion that the bottom-up approach is just as important as the top-down approach to ending the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, then I urge you to support um, this project and our partnership with UBC in making this a reality. There are many ways you can support us. Um, there are these postcards outside that you can pick up, um, and they list the ways that you can support us. Um, there's uh, sign-up sheets. They might be going around or they might just be outside um, that you can give us your name and your email address. We want to keep, uh, uh, keep uh, we, well, we want to re remain in contact with you guys. Um, so that we can tell you about events like this tonight, so we can tell you about what's happening with the youth that are coming here, so that we can invite you to get involved, so that we can um, invite you to come to the screening of the films that will happen in the summer. Um, we have, there are 15 films that were made by Israeli and Palestinian Canadian youth together, and they're all up on our website. Website's on here, pieceittogether.com, easy to remember. And 
l watch those films. If any of them touch you or, or you, you get some reaction from them, share them. They're all very, very easily shareable in uh, very many different platforms. Go ahead and share them with others. Um, and spread the word. That's really important for us, too. And then finally, if you're so inspired, we, would, can, we can really use contributions. So you can make a donation online through our website. You can do it here tonight um, at the table outside. And um, at any time in the future, that would be greatly, greatly appreciated. So thank you very much for coming tonight. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rena. It's uh, left only for me to Are they not thank uh, Rena and Sammy and Gershon. Uh, and their organizations, Prime, IPCRI, and Piece It Together, uh, for really courageously showing us the way forward. H.G. Wells said in his, uh, in his uh, text on history that history is a race between education and catastrophe. And I think uh, IPCRI, Prime, and Piece It Together are elements of education that can make sure we win that race. Thank you all for being here tonight. Just, this is just a moment in time of an endless journey, but we've seen great direction tonight. One Thank last you. thing, sorry, before the, the big applause here. It's there, I, <laughs> I want to present a gift to, to the three people, I, as well as thanking Gershon and Sammy for coming here. I want to make a special, incredibly big thank you to the University of British Columbia.